I've got a quick, quick question for you, alright? I wanna hear your thoughts, wanna know what's on your mind. I've got a quick, quick question for you, alright? The answer's not important, I'm just glad that we could talk tonight. So, what's your favorite? How did you get? I think you'll have a great time here I think you'll have a great time here So, hello again and welcome to another episode of Quick Question with Soren and Daniel The podcast where two best friends and comedy writers ask each other questions and give each other answers I am one half of that podcast Author of How to Fight President, senior writer for last week tonight, and before that held a number of job titles at comedy site Crack.com, from intern to assistant editor to columnist to head writer to head of video to director of content development, right up until the very moment my department was dissolved to trick Wall Street into believing our parent company was good at business. All told, I have been writing comedy professionally in some form or another since 2008. Daniel O'Brien, joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Soren Bowie. Soren, the florin is yours. Thank you, Daniel. My name is Soren Bowie. I am a writer for American Dad. I was also held uh, most conceivable positions at Cracked, not head of video. That was exclusively Daniel. Uh, and I also, uh, I, I was the one who cut and run early. I didn't get destroyed in the uh, massive layoffs of Cracked because I... Uh, <laughs> I saw the writing on the wall and ran yeah. away. <laughs> you saw what was coming. While I stood atop couches saying I'm unfireable, you <laughs> very much saw which way the wind was blowing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I feel a little bad because, well, I feel a lot bad about everything that happened, but I feel a little bad for this very one specific thing, which is as people continue to talk about Cracked and like the day that, that it died, it, according to them, um, I get I get lumped in with that a lot where people are like, I can't believe that they fired all this, like all the, all these people work together at one time and they fired all of them. And, uh, <laughs> I don't have like, it's not in my heart to like fix the story for them, but I'm like, I, they deserve this. Like they deserve your credit. Right. Like they, they did get fired and it was painful and it was bad for them. Uh, I ran yeah, there, away. <laughs> there, there's, there's some things that I, that I just sort of let, uh, the, the narrative be imperfect. Like, Michael, on principle, quit when uh, our parent company fired our two directors, Abe and Adam. Michael was just like, I'm not, I can't support this company anymore. That's bad. So he left on his own accord. You left for a different job. And almost immediately after that, like within a month or so, yeah, two months. everyone in our department were, what was it? Two months. Two months. Everyone in our department and other departments were laid off. And so to... As far as like even diehard viewers and readers were concerned, all of this happened at the same time because everyone was working and doing things and very, very visible. And then suddenly a million people on Twitter were saying that they no longer worked at Cracked. And also uh, After Hours, which had been running consistently for 10 years, just stopped existing. So it really seemed like all of their their people and their their favorite things just ended at the exact same time. Right. Uh, like, it, the details aren't important <laughs> enough to to, to, to quibble, address. quibble over. Yeah. Uh, there, there, and and like people would be like, I can't believe like they, there was Soren, Michael, Katie, Dan. They all got fired at once, and I'm like, well, one of those people got fired. <laughs> 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 one of them never worked there, and then another, <laughs> the other two quit early. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, you're right. I mean, it is bad. It it does feel like all four of them were fired when Daniel got fired. It, it does. <laughs> and, and, and certainly, uh, even the people who didn't have like a nine to five salaried position at Cracked, when the departments got dissolved, the work disappeared for those people, the other familiar faces to viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they work did stop for them and a source of income dried up for them as well. That's true. Yeah. I mean, even the ones that didn't technically work there still worked there. It was also, yeah. you know, it's, it's an internet company. So it was, I, I for, <laughs> for the amount of time that I actually had a column and that I was doing stuff for the site, I didn't work there for like the first four years of that. Correct. Because that's the way that it's built. It's built so that you're not paying people a salary 
And so you're not giving them health insurance and you're not like, they're not technically employees. So you've got a bunch of people that you, it's like the burgeoning of the freelance, the gig economy. Yeah. And, uh, and so a bunch of us never worked for, or didn't work for crack for a very long time. And then eventually, because we were indispensable, they were like, okay, right. we'll make you an editor. <laughs> right. The option is hire this person or, or s suddenly the site falls apart because they've made right. themselves a brick in the wall. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way that, that creatives have been exploited since the beginning of time and will be, and will continue to be exploited forever. I, I don't want to like suggest to anyone that I was like, aside from those apart from that. I mean, I participated into the, in the exploitation. I remember. I know that's what, yeah. that's, that's what's so insidious about it is, is yeah. that it, it's, you wanted to work at Cracked. You wanted to, yeah. to write comedy and the, you know, it's not. It's not always like a sinister guy with a mustache who is who is like bribing you with exposure or or trying to make you plant a seed in your head that you should be grateful for the opportunity to to write comedy and and right. have a platform. It's like ingrained in us as as artists and creatives from birth. You know, we we all the thing about this uh, ridiculous career that I've dedicated my entire life to is it's it takes a very long time to recognize the work that you do as labor. Everything else, before you get to that point, you just think, I am so lucky to be here. I should be grateful for any and every opportunity. Well, it's it's something that you're doing because you can't help but do it. So like, you're mm -hmm. not, it's just going to keep coming out of you. Right. And, and, <laughs> and so like, to be like, and you should pay me for it too. It's like, well, no, you're just going to keep doing it. <laughs> like, and right. you understand that implicitly. Like, you're like, well, you're right. Um, I just have to make it so good that you will then pay me for it. And so like, they're, yeah, they built into being an artist is like, I don't deserve money for this. I'm going to do it no matter what. Right. Because it's, I can't think of any of my other jobs where it's like, well, you better pay me to sell shoes at sports Authority, But if you don't, I'm still going to do it somewhere else. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it in on my, my own. free time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah it's it's weirder in that respect but i mean we also when, once i was a, a part of crack that i when i was a senior editor at the site and we could have interns we had an intern that uh i don't want to use his full name but we had an intern named dan and mm -hmm. i remember he was very eager and very excited about the site and at one point his internship was coming up uh to an end and he pulled me aside and he was like so uh do you do you think i'll get a job here now and i was like Oh no, you've been here for, <laughs> oh. you've been here for like, and I was like, I laid it out for him. Like, you've been here for like two months. Yeah. You, this is the way that the system works is that you will, if you want to continue to work for the site, you will do it as basically a, a freelancer and you'll do it at the whims of like what hours the site actually needs and like what, and finding you have to basically, you have to decide what the site needs. You have to yeah. be like, oh, you know what? There's no presence on Instagram and Instagram is blowing up. Let's like, let's blow out their Instagram. And so like, then once you do that and you prove yourself, then, then you get a job. And, and like, he's, I could just like see it wearing on him that like, that was the case. And I was like, oh yeah, man, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> this totally sucks. This system is bad. <laughs> it's a bad system, bad business model. I think about, uh, not our podcast necessarily, but like the podcast, uh, ecosystem in general because because our podcast is like it's our business that we're buying into right so mm -hmm. like so you and i wh whatever time we put into this is like this is this is our choice we are investing in this show and this podcast empire i think it's fair to say because <laughs> at this point yeah because we believe it'll 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 pay off but i, th I think about um how similar like the current podcast landscape is to uh early exploitative internet days because we're we're there are so many podcasts out there run by so many funny people and a lot of them have very funny and talented friends so like you can't everywhere you look there's funny person guesting on another funny person's podcast most of them don't get paid for that right. because you're again you're creatives who are being sold this idea that like you're, it's just fun. You're just talking to your buddy, and wouldn't you be doing that otherwise? Wouldn't you? It's this. It's the same thing as a column, essentially, where it's like, yeah, you're creating a, you're, you're, you're hanging out. It feels silly to get paid for this. You're just doing jokes. Yeah, but it's, it's, 
it's uh, jokes that you have at your disposal and like a quick wittedness and, uh, you know, whatever other strengths you bring to a conversation that you have because you've spent years in improv classes or writing or consuming right. comedy. This is still like it took effort to give you this level of expertise. And even if it feels like you're just having a phone call that's filmed, you're on you're on Doughboys talking about Del Taco or whatever, you're creating two hours of content that someone is consuming and someone is getting paid for. And I, I, it, I, it worries me to see the podcast industry now. I know some people pay some money for guests. Shout out Daily Zeitgeist. Shout out uh, Secretly in- Incredibly Fascinating. But a lot of podcasts out there, because they seem so casual, they're ignoring the fact that like there's a reason that such and such comedian was booked on such and such a podcast. There's a reason that people listen to it. It's because there's value there and it's uh, creatives at every step of the way have uh, been tricked and self tricked into thinking that there's not, or again, that we're lucky to be here. And it's a, uh, it's a bummer. I mean, yeah, every, every piece of, of content that exists is a, uh, financial contract labor is traded for uh, money and for getting that creates the conditions for exploitation and we all need to remember that I don't, is, can you tell that the that being on strike for a summer radicalized me <laughs> uh, I have a I have a buddy Sam Bergen who uh, shout out to Sam he when I was first doing like um, Friday night shows at this in this alley in Santa Monica where I was doing sketch or uh, even improv, um, we would they try and get our friends to come, obviously, because who else is going to come see you? And part of that was that you could get comps for people. You could get them comp tickets. And so, like, when I found out, he, I was just one day I know he was coming to a show, and I was like, I'll get you tickets. He's like, no, 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 I'll pay for them. And I was like, no, I can just give you tickets. He's like, no, I want to support my friends when they do something creative. And I was like, Oh, damn it. I do too. <laughs> and from yeah. like that day forward, that was like, I was like 22. And from that day forward, like, I won't, I won't, when Jason, Jason will oftentimes ask us, do you want a copy of my book? Like, do you want me to just send it to you? And I'll be like, no, I will go buy your fucking book. <laughs> yeah. I, I know at this point, like, it's already we devalue ourselves enough. And then for our friends as well, like we're giving our, our friends like, no, you should get this for free. That's not the case. I want to, I want to pay you for what you do. I want you right. to have the money because you deserve it. Yeah. We just went through this, uh, my oldest brother and sister-in-law, they run a uh, music school and they had their, uh, like a big recital with all of their kids p- playing music or a lot of them are, were singing. And so my brother put together like a, a pit band essentially of my other brother on drums, me on bass and a friend of ours, Sean on guitar to play as like the, the backing rock and roll band for any of the kids who wanted to sing a rock and roll song. And it was very fun. Uh, shout out to five melody music. Check it out. It's a great, if you, uh, if they can fit you in for lessons, cause they're really booked pretty solid, then you should. And if you're in the New Jersey area, take lessons there. Um, but we were like playing this show and it was so fun and, and heartwarming and inspiring. And, uh, we got paid for doing it, the pit band. And we were like, no, you got, like we're, we're family and like, it's fun to, to play music. And my brother was, was very, very firm about this. Cause he, he's been a uh, playing and touring musician for his entire life. Like, no, this is, this is time that you're putting in it's effort. You you're learning the songs on your own. You went to a practice and you went to a performance. The performance was a couple hours. Musicians get paid period. And it's the thing that uh, everyone who does any kind of creative work, even if it's something you would do anyway, and even if you think you're just having fun, you should recognize that it is labor and it is work. And, uh, and you're it doing it for value. everybody else. You're doing it for everybody yeah. else who's in the same position. Like you, you accept it because uh, this, otherwise the system becomes exploitative. If you say, no, I, I, I would do this anyway. No, that's not the, like, you have to understand that there has to be an exchange for everybody else as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, that's, that's not what I, that's not what I thought we were going to talk about today. No, I had no plan of doing that either. I, but it is I, nice that we're talking about artists, right? Yeah. My whole thing, my plan going into this was, oh, you're trying to steer us into the actual topic. I am, but you've got more to say, so that's fine. Keep yeah. Going. My whole thing was, I'm going to, I'm going to change things up and do a really long introduction uh 
And then I was going to throw it to you for you to do an an introduction that was also long. But then as I was writing out my intro, I I realized that I I stumbled upon the gem that is Soren the Florin is Yorin's. Yeah. And I'm like, that's fun. That's an, I should have done that instead of a fo- like that should have been the game this episode. <laughs> <laughs> How it took me fucking four and a half years to find that one. <laughs> it is really I mean, it's so funny when you can trace that in somebody's writing, like just sketches, you could always see it, but uh, even in like episodes, when people turn in a table draft and you're like Oh, I see. But you sort of found out what this episode was halfway through. <laughs> you found out like the really fun thing. Like that's where the fun is. Um, and and people will still be like, well, you know, like you need all the lead up. <laughs> you need everything just to get there. And you're like, yeah, no, I agree with you. But like, that's clearly where all the fun was, was right there. Yeah. I think one day the next, the, the next book that I turn in, I'm sure it'll be around chapter four that the author will address the audience be like, hey, I didn't really figure out what this book was until now, and now it's going to really start singing. I should have gone back and revised the first three chapters, but... <laughs> it's a lot of work. But I put the work in already. <laughs> and they're not bad. I mean, no, that's some like, parts of it are good. It doesn't fit, but like, solid, you'll like it. <laughs> solid B writing right there. <laughs> Somebody will get something from it, I bet. Yeah. Um, um, so let's yeah. get into the show, though. Now let's that, now that we're, we're done with the, the radicalized pro-union, I don't know, the communist manifesto Brian part of the show. No, uh, it's, we were just, we, we were touting capitalism just now, Dan. We were saying you should get paid for your services. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Go <laughs> capitalism. Perfect system. No notes. Uh, Soren, you want to talk about movies? Yeah, I do. I've been, I've been thinking about this lately. Uh, you're going to help me come up with the, the, the best phrasing of this because we're using artist pretty broadly, uh, but the thing I'm I'm trying to figure out are what are the best uh, depictions of artists in movies and TV shows where the artist character is supposed to be very good at what they do, and you as a viewer believe that in their in their performance. I can I can the it gets stronger when I explain what I'm talking about. I think the platonic ideal version of this is the band The Wonders from that thing you do that is a movie i was just gonna give you a a quintessential version but go ahead i've got another one for you but go ahead the the plot of that movie is there's a band in the 60s that writes a uh pop tune and it is such a great tune that the band starts touring around to county fairs and then they get huge they do they tour all over the country they got screaming fans their their song races up the charts and then they perform on that world's version of the Ed Sullivan show. Big hit from this band. The buy-in is so high for movies and shows like this. Yeah. Because you need, the audience needs to, the modern audience who's watching this needs to agree that the song is good enough to justify their success. That's like my platonic ideal because I think that song, that thing you do, fucking Banks, yeah. rocks. It's written by uh, the late Adam Schlesinger from... Uh, Fountains of Wayne, and it like performs its job so well of sounding like it's of that time, sounding like it would be a hit, and also not for nothing, a song that you you better be prepared to hear seven hundred times every time you watch that yeah. movie and not get bored of it. And it ticks all of those boxes, and it's like, yes, I believe this band is as good as the movie wants me to believe. Right? Yeah, it's such a it's such a tall ask in a movie because already you're creating this piece of art. You're creating a story, and so it's got to have all the elements of a story. It's got to have arcs for everybody, and like your characters need to learn something, and like the story has to be entertaining and good the whole way and tight. And then, adi- and additionally, you're adding another piece of art within it that has to feel like real art. And it's like, well, I, if I just created that, I could sell that instead. <laughs> like, yeah, and and it and so it's very difficult to do. I think Marvelous Miss Maisel is an example on the opposite side where it's like, here's this woman who does stand up and like, you're supposed to learn about her life at this, in this early time period where women were just starting to do stand up. It's like, people really love the show, but they're like, yeah, the stand ups kind of sucks. <laughs> it's like, yeah, obviously, Man. because if you wrote like really good stand up sets, like you could use that independently. That could be its own creature outside of this movie. So you're basically throwing away a piece of art inside your bigger piece of art. Yeah. Stand up and writing, I think, are ones that are very difficult so to hard. to translate. Like the the uh, 
I don't know that I've seen a movie or show where there is a character who is supposed to be very good at stand up and then they do stand up and I'm laughing as much as I would be laughing at an actual comedian that doing stand up. Yeah. I, I I like doing stand up. Mulaney it's or so hard. Um, or whoever. The, the closest I think I've seen is there are like moments in funny people where I'm like mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, that is stand up. Where, but it's just like a couple of jokes. The whole sets, I mean, in, in, in most of the stuff you see is not supposed to be that good because it's a young, struggling stand up. But like right. when Adam Sandler's up there and he's doing it, there are moments where you're like, yeah, okay, <laughs> okay, I'm yeah. buying this. There's one moment that Seth Rogen has where um, Aubrey Plaza says to him, I can't remember how it comes up in conversation, but she says that she has a skinny vagina and he says, she should try feeding it carbs. <laughs> and i'm like yeah there we go <laughs> um but yeah it's man it's stand-up is really really hard i think writing writing is tough um and i think there's a lot of like ways to round it like you can like you're you can have your writer be into themselves too much or like you can like tell st- a story of the writer through the writing but to just have purely good writing is i think next to impossible yeah i think if i, if I still worked a uh, a crack.com style list that I would do if that site still existed and was paying fair wages. I would like to go through seven to 10 uh, versions in movies where an author character is reading an excerpt from their book and just, to, and like try to genuinely figure out, is this actually a, uh, do we think this is a good book? Do we think this is good writing stripped completely from the the context of what, the movie or show is telling us like, yeah, be- because that's the part that I, I don't buy. And the, the two that jump out at me right now, because they specifically have sections in the movie where the character reads an excerpt from their book, mm-hmm. uh, Ant-Man quantum mania, Paul Rudd's character <laughs> okay. reads, uh, like does it's, it's readings in movies are very funny to me because I've done them and I know what they're like. And it's very strange. The, the, the movie opens with him giving a reading from his autobiography or his memoir or whatever. And he reads the end of his book. He reads like the concluding thoughts that, that wrap everything up in his book. And, uh, I have three things to say about it. One, I understand why it's there because it like very effectively sets up the movie completely separate from the book is this is if if you want to play catch up on what Ant-Man has been doing this is a really good uh not very elegant way of letting him tell you I'm an Avenger I did this I saved the world I did that here are my thoughts on everything all right look out for the little guy it's a very effective narration to set up a movie a terrible way to end a book is thought number 2 <laughs> it's a really bad way to end a book thought number 3 is awful choice if you're giving a reading of a book you don't don't read the end you don't read the end <laughs> a book it's reading just my is, favorite part so i thought you'd all enjoy it <laughs> a book reading is when you're like trying to get people to buy your book and it's such a silly strange what thing to do sell. and you're not like like giving them the meatiest part you're not giving them uh anything intriguing you're just like you're wrapping everything up and completely uh Give, not at all giving anyone a reason to buy your book. Yeah. Well, uh, go ahead. Go on. Sorry. I was going to say, I not to like, uh, at this point we're giving bad examples because I'm really washing the balls of this question and being like, this is such a good question. <laughs> but it's I really have one more. About. I have one more that I want to go to that's like, I think they're doing it wrong. Um, do you know who Mike Flanagan is? Um, that he wrote sounds The Haunting familiar? of Hill House, Blythe oh, yeah, Manor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, all, he's uh, Midnight yeah, Mass. He was like, like dominating all the the netflix horror stuff with his troupe yeah yeah every year he's got something new from uh it's a very different way to do horror where there's like a lot of it's a lot of um trauma like personal trauma that gets turned into horror throughout this each story Mm -hmm. Uh, um and i mean horror was always kind of doing that but he's doing it very explicitly and he's the and so the haunting of hill house i don't know if you ever watched it but like one of the family members that grows up in this haunted house grows up to be a storyteller or to be a not a storyteller he comes up to be an author and he writes a book about this house that he grew up in and so there's a lot of um narration happening 
throughout it. It's like get from scene to scene. All the connective tissue is just this guy reading his book. And they really try, man. They really try to make this sound like a book. And making it sound like a a horror story, I think they are successful in. Making it sound mm-hmm. like a good horror story, <laughs> I think, is is not as good. I think it's. I think they're, yeah. they're like missing the mark quite a bit. Um, but they're they're really trying to make this guy sound like he really knows what he's talking about. And I didn't realize that until the movie. I know the movie the, until the show ended, where I was like, "Oh, we were supposed to think that was all really good." <laughs> I, th- right. I thought it was just this dude like pontificating about his youth and he, with this purple writing that was so so purple that he like, you just got to yeah. light on, take a nap after reading it. It's so much easier and safer uh, if you just decide that your artist is kind of a hack. It's like like the yeah, it's totally. an obvious obvious two sides of the same coin example. But everything that Thirty Rock did right versus everything that Studio Sixty did wrong in the two shows that came out at the exact same time that are both about a Saturday Night Live esque variety show. Thirty Rock was smart because. Right off the bat, they decided this is a show that exists. Our, our girly show is a, is a sketch show that exists, but uh, critics don't like it and viewership is down. And there's a chance it's not very good because all of us are hacks. And so every sketch that they show from the show, every like glimpse of a sketch is allowed to be stupid and bad yeah. because it fits in with the world they've built. Studio 60 decides right off the bat, this is the best comedy show in the world that we're making. And it's important and it's controversial because it pushes so many buttons. You really set yourself up for failure when you decide the show within your universe is that good because yeah. how could it be? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, like the tallest order, I think for on television is if you've got a narrative show or a scripted show is writing characters that are funny and know that they're funny. Like yeah. it's so, so hard to write somebody who's being fun. Like they can, they can act funny, but like not intentionally. And like that adds to the humor. But when somebody has to be funny on purpose, it's like, oh man, it's so, <laughs> there's so many elements that have to go right. First of all, the, the, the performance has to be good, spot on, but like the jokes have to be good. And a, a show that did it really well, I think was Roseanne. Like the early scenes of Roseanne where the two, you just want to see the two of them in love, like Dan and Roseanne and the way that they bicker and like fight with each other in like a very joking way is so good and like on the nose and fun. And like, they're yeah. very good at it together. But like, I think any other time I had an episode where I had to write where Francine was like way more compelling and charismatic than Stan. And so I needed examples of that. So she was like at his work at like a CIA soiree and she's holding court there. And I was like writing that first scene where she's holding court. I was like, oh shit, how do you be charming? <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> charming it's always, on purpose. It's very uh, terrifying whenever I'm working on a pilot and uh, a character has to like successfully flirt with another character. <laughs> yes. And it's like, yeah. I don't know how this goes. I don't know. <laughs> I need. The, the fake woman in the TV show, I, I can make her like what this guy's selling, but the audience needs to buy it too. And I don't. <laughs> <laughs> totally. If I knew yeah. what successful flirting was, my life would be very different. Yeah, if I was really good at this, <laughs> I wouldn't have this job. <laughs> I would be doing something else. Um, I, the, the quintessential example in the right direction that I was going to give, and just in case mm-hmm. anyone has lost the thread because we've been talking for so long, it's like performances that are in which somebody is an artist and you really buy them as the artist because the, what they're producing is so phenomenal. Um, the other quintessential example I would give is Kirk Lazarus in Tropic Thunder. Yeah. Um, who is, he's like an Australian actor who dives into a character like Daniel day Lewis and doesn't resurface until the movie is over. And, and in, in, as a consequence gives the performance of a lifetime and Robert Downey Jr gives such an outstanding performance. <laughs> um, I know it's caught some heat, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, it's re- he does a really, really good job. Yeah. I My two sides of the actor coin, because I think acting is also a really hard thing to depict in a movie because yeah. it's so, it's spinning around in your head as like, there is an actor playing a character playing an actor. And like, you can you can say the actor is doing a good job playing the character, but I still don't buy the actor in the movie. 
yeah. as being like a hundred percent super good. Um, the, the, the two spectrums I have one is, uh, and I'm actually, so the, the bad one is entourage and like Adrian <laughs> Grenier as an actor, I don't think is very good. Right. I think he's likable. I think he's he's very <laughs> handsome. I don't I I think it's not taking too many shots to say he's not the most versatile actor in the world, case in point. Where has he been? What does he do? He did seven seasons and maybe two entourage movies and a few rom coms sprinkled about, but but you know, he's not primarily known as an actor. That's Adrian Grenier, the person, the actor. He plays in Entourage Vincent Chase and uh that show has a ton of problems, especially uh, in retrospect. But something that I struggled with, even when I was watching it uh, as like a high school and college student when it first came out, was I don't understand if Vincent Chase is supposed to be a good actor. Like if if the point is, it's, it's based on Mark Wahlberg's life. And I believe Mark Wahlberg thinks himself to be a very good actor. So if you follow that thread, then Vincent Chase is supposed to be good. But you get a couple of examples of him acting in the show, and it's not yeah. very different than Adrian Grenier's acting, which I think we all agree is not very good. <laughs> and that's something like as I'm watching it as a 17 year old, I'm just like, if if the if the world of this show agrees that Vinny Chase is just like hot and likable and good on camera, then it's a very easy buy-in. Totally. But now he's doing James Cameron's Aquaman and he's he's working with Scorsese, he's working with Spielberg, he's doing these like like gritty independent films and these and these biopics and like I don't I and he's successful at it. I don't I don't know that they've really done a good job convincing me that Vinny Chase is a good actor. Yeah, man. What a a hard sell that is too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I totally agree with you. Yeah, he's not he he does not, that and like he yeah he does movies about like his where he grew up and stuff like that yeah and so like Queens Boulevard and he wanted to be authentic and hard and it's like that's not it's not working man yeah the good um, version I have of acting in a movie is yeah and I just rewatched the scene it's so fucking good I've got one uh, for you as well go ahead oh good um the movie Birdman which is the primarily the Michael Keaton vehicle and it's and it's it gets a lot of attention for how good he is in it and also how the movie. Is is essentially a, a sequence of wonders, really long shots with no cuts. It almost looks like the entire movie was shot with no cuts at all. There's just like a few seams in there that you can tell. So that gets a lot of the attention. But something that's a bit undersung is there's a plot point in the movie where Michael Cle- Keaton is doing this play with an actor that he thinks is bad. He, he feels like the actor is like, you could see he's acting and he wants something better and he wants something more naturalistic. And they get rid of that actor and replace them with uh, Edward Norton's character. And Norton is like thrown into this movie as uh, an asshole, but also someone who is like supposed to be a very good actor. Like that's his whole thing is like, this guy's supposed to be great. That's why he's allowed to be kind of a prick is because he's such a good actor. And there's a long, amazing scene where Ed Norton and Michael Keaton are like about to do a scene from the play within the movie and they're just like working their way into it. And Ed Norton is like being a bossy, annoying actor. Uh, and then starts acting as the character in the play, reading lines that we've heard from the play before. And he is, and he turns on a dime to just like embody the part that he's playing. And he is so fucking good. It's like the acting that he is doing in the play is, <sighs> in a weird way, slightly better than the acting that he is doing in the movie. It's crazy. It's such, and like, I know in real life, Ed Norton is, is apparently very difficult to work with, but he's so fucking good in this scene. He's so good in this movie that it's just like how dialed in of a performance that is, where it's like, I'm Ed Norton and I'm going to be a good actor playing this asshole character. And now I'm going to be this asshole character being a really good actor in this scene opposite Michael Keaton in a way that makes Michael Keaton's character look like a worse actor than Edward Norton's character. And it's just Incredible. so damn good. Man, that's awesome. I, I haven't seen that movie in a very long time. I should watch it again. Uh, the example I have is very similar in that it's somebody who's like, whose performance in the movie itself 
is not as good as what they do in like their acting within the the pretend movie within it. Um, have you seen Mulholland Drive? Uh, no. Well, I've I saw uh, part of it a bunch of times. <laughs> When they find the corpse, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there was a lesbian sex scene in that movie. Yeah. Um, okay. When I was younger and no one was home, I would track down that corpse scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where they find the body. It is really horrifying when they find it. Like Yes. Um, but Naomi, Naomi Watts in that movie gives a very stilted performance on purpose, I think, to serve the narrative. I don't, I won't, I won't pretend to fully understand Mulholland Drive. I think that this is some woman's memory, a a more happy memory of her coming to LA to become an actress. And so in her memory, like she's not a, she's not even a good actor in her own memory. Like she's just Mm -hmm. not very good. So Naomi Watts is giving kind of like this stilted performance a little bit, but then she has an audition that she has to do. It's a real audition because she is an actress. She goes in does this audition and she just turns like it's, it's really, yeah, it's like flipping a switch where you're like, Oh, oh my God, (laughs) this person is giving it all. Um, She gives this amazing performance where she's telling this guy to leave, but she doesn't want him to leave. And she's like, her father's upstairs and she, and she's like, my father will hear us and you should go and telling him to go the entire time. But she's like, really doesn't want him to leave. And it's so sexy and so like pitch perfect and auditions in general are never that. So like it's all her, it's just her in this stark hospital type room this clinical room in front of a bunch of other people giving the most amazing performance i've ever seen and it's so so good you also she she turns into it so like she starts the audition and just like i don't know anybody else out there who's had to audition you it takes a couple they throw you in you come in you you slate you give say who you are and who you're represented by and then they drop you into the scene and so like you kind of ramp up into the scene like you're not just like in it immediately. And she does that in this. Like she's her the first stuff she's doing in it is like, okay, this isn't going great. And then at one point he puts his hand near her butt and she grabs his hand and puts it on her. And then all of a sudden she's a different person. And it's it's amazing to watch. It's so dialed in. Mm. I guess I should see the other parts of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> or is it like so j- just based on the scene that I know and the the lore around this movie is how weird and confusing and dark it is. Uh, and now the only other information I have is this scene that you're telling me about. I truly had no idea what this movie is about. Okay. She's an actor. Yeah. She's an actress huh. who comes to LA. Um, we're, it, it's, we're assuming like that's the case. And like, there's this woman who's got amnesia who she meets and they become like good friends and kind of detectives together. And then they fall in love. Detectives. But, yeah, because they're trying to figure out why she has him, like what her life was, because there's people trying oh. to kill her and stuff. Ah. All of this is a fantasy, I think, in Mulholland Drive, a fantasy of this young actress who had come out to to L.A. And we do see her later on, and she looks very, very different and very strung out. And like life just did, did L.A. just like chewed her up. And she did have a relationship with this other woman, but then like that relationship fell apart clearly, and that's when we see the corpse um but Hmm. it's it's supposed to i think it's a it's somebody who was dreaming of hollywood then also dreaming her own story in hollywood after it's happened and making it much better than it was i think i don't actually know um do you want another example yeah i'd love one because i think the next one that i was going to pull is is well, I'll just do it anyway. Okay. It's a, another example of a writer in a movie that uh, I I don't think is good, even though the movie tells me it's good. And it's uh, the movie is last five years, and the plot hinges on this twenty uh, four year old to twenty nine year old novelist who just skyrockets to the top of the book charts. And uh, there's similarly to the other movie that I was talking about that there's a scene where he does a reading from his book and it's a, it's a very funny situation because like the, I don't know how, it, how I would approach this as a screenwriter either, but it's a screenwriter who has written a great movie and a great musical, Jason Robert Brown, who wrote this great story and knows how to write 
dialogue, knows how to write songs, knows how to write uh, emotions and 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 people and how they talk. And then it comes with a scene where it's like, all right, and now I need to prove that this character is a really good author who writes books that captivate the whole country. And the excerpt that he reads just seems like uh, the screenwriter choked and forgot how words go and just wrote a <laughs> bunch of things that sound like a book, which is, yeah. which is the problem. And again, like I'm not, no, no shade to anyone who worked on the movie. I don't know what I would do either. If I was writing a movie that I thought was good and then suddenly it called for a scene that featured good writing, I have no idea what the fuck I would do. Oh, it's so scary. That, just thinking about that makes my heart race. <laughs> it's like now, now you got to write like something really good. Yeah. Like, well, oh, like all the, it's gotta be, it's gotta <laughs> be better words than any of the words I've used in the rest of the movie. <laughs> and I used all my good ones. I used my favorite words. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen this movie. I'm leading up on it now. Um, Last five years. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a musical that like really, oh. Oh. Uh, <laughs> really affected me and all of my friends growing up. We just loved it and, and sang all the songs. It's like really heartbreaking, fun musical, the way that it, it, works and why it's called last five years uh it's very fun when it's staged that every there's only two scenes where it's two characters in the whole show there's only two scenes where they're actually uh interacting together the way everything else works uh every scene that the woman kathy is in starts at year five and works backwards from five to one and their relationship is over in year five and starts in year one and every song that the guy sings every one of his scenes jamie that goes forward in time so you oh. just see you get like the same story told frontwards and backwards so it's like a uh year five from her year one from him then back and forth they trade off they That's meet cool. in the middle when they're getting married and then you just get to see like the two sides of this relationship and how it plays out that's really cool and really well done that's a and really then they, made, they made a movie about it i like that uh, that's a really interesting fun way to do a rashomon is like yeah change the direction of time. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'll I'll watch this musical. <sighs> I hope um, you do. Because on the other, like, the other fascinating stuff that I want to talk about last five years with to, uh, to you about, or however that sentence goes, <laughs> I is know what you mean. there are a bunch of songs that are on the cutting room floor, but that still exists oh. that you can find. Because this was, like, very autobiographical by Jason Robert Brown. And the woman he wrote it about, about either like sued him or just like got early access and made a big stink over it because she was like this is too much my life this is too much us in oh. this thing that you're making and making money off of so he had to like scrap a couple of songs oh okay that's for our later episode about like what is and isn't uh appropriate to write about if you're writing about your life dude that's actually a really great question <laughs> i know <laughs> um but my we have an old colleague anna roth who used to say that uh writing should cost and like by that she means it should cost you something in your life like really good writing should cost you something and no oh, that's nuts and i was like oh but i don't want it to <laughs> yeah <laughs> um my another, i have an example from a movie that it, when you first pitched this idea to me i was like this was the first movie that came to mind because it was so seminal for me when I was young. The movie Finding Forrester. Oh. Have you seen that? No, I haven't, but I've been meaning to. <laughs> for, for the last 26 helpful? years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Once Sean Connery died 11 years ago, I was like, damn, I got to do a re- Connery died 11 years ago, I was like, get into this guy's career. Um, well, the the premise is, is that uh, it's a young kid who joins a a prep school. He doesn't feel like he fits in there. A lot of it is racially motivated. Um, and the teachers, I think there, maybe there's some like racist issues too. Like he's got an English teacher who's not very kind to him, but he makes friends with essentially a JD Salinger analog. This guy mm -hmm. who lives alone is a hermit, uh, called Forrester and he finds him and like, and then starts writing with this guy. And this guy really is taken with this kid. Cause the kid is such a good writer. And, um, so there's a lot of points in it where like, there's a man who's a America's author, like the, the writer of a, the American, the great American story is 
trying to teach a young kid how to write. And then you get little excerpts of what they've written too. And as a kid, I was like, this is, I was like, I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> this is incredible. Like they're talking about it in these, in these such a great grandiose ways. So I rewatched some of these scenes and there's one in particular where- You watch Finding Forrester and your takeaway is like, even me, a white blonde kid, <laughs> I could be a writer too. And it seems like it might even be easier for me than what this fellow's going through. It was great to see <laughs> representation in the film. So that I felt like I could do that too. Cause I was also like 15 or 16. Uh, right. And so was this basketball star. I didn't have the basketball part. <laughs> right. Um, it wouldn't distract you. <laughs> so I could be an even better writer. Um, but there's a scene where he gets accused of plagiarism. For Forrester has given this young kid a, a prompt. He'd given him like some of his writing and be like, start, just start typing what you see here on the page. And then as soon as you're ready, just go off on your own. And that's where you get like, pound the keys, dog. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and so he turns that in as a paper. It gets immediately flagged for plagiarism because the first paragraph is from this great author, Forrester. And this teacher can't wait to fucking punish this kid. He's so psyched <laughs> that he caught him cheating. And so uh, he gets pushed out of this, like, he's, they almost kick him out of the school. Um, eventually, there's this reading where everybody does of what they've written. And he's not allowed to participate. But Forrester does show up. And Forrester starts reading it. And everyone assumes that this is him reading his own stuff. And they, the teacher, who is such a dick, is like, well, I think we're all so inspired by your words. You have such a way with with the English language. And he's like, those aren't my words. Those are, those are the words of this child. And yeah. uh, him reading this thing, he jumps in. You don't get much of it. You probably get a paragraph of it, but in it, you're like, yeah, this is working. <laughs> like I totally buy this as an essay from the great American author. It's a, it's I, they're so successful in it. And so I rewatched it thinking, yeah, that's gotta be it. That's gotta be it. And I rewatched it and I was like, Okay, <laughs> divorce of context, you're not really, it is a lot of the right words. It's all like yeah. the stuff that you want it to be. It has the feel that you want it to have. But like anything, you take it out of context and you're like, well, hold on. I don't know like how that ties in thematically to anything in the actual, like, I, I don't know if that actually works. It's just some good yeah. words in a row. And you think about like when you got questioned by the FBI and they split apart an, an article that you had written <laughs> to right. ask you questions about. And they're like, why is this funny? Is this supposed to be funny? And they just read a sentence out of context. You're like, well, you're not doing it any favors. You don't, yeah. you don't dissect the bird <laughs> to find the song, my friend. Like you got to right. imagine you gotta... if you were reading this and you didn't hate the author. <laughs> just pretend for a second. You don't think the person who wrote this is a terrorist or a threat <laughs> to the country. You can see it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's, Anything you just take completely divorce of context, you're like, and now just here's this moment. Isn't that perfect? You're like, well, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> um, but you're right. It had like all this, it had the same sing song quality. It had like the lilt that language should have. It had like, it has all of those elements in the four sentences or whatever that we get. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's good writing. There's a good example I, of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would actually, if I was ever writing a movie that featured an author character and the author was supposed to be good and they gave a reading, I think I would steal a trick from the Forrester playbook and I would have like an actual good author come in to just write that part, to just write that scene. So that if critics afterwards were like, yeah, the author's supposed to be good. The author character's supposed to be good, but the reading was bad. I'd be like, oh yeah, Gia Tolentino wrote that and you <laughs> love her, so fuck you. <laughs> and now you look like a bad person. That was Margaret Atwood, you idiot. You motherfucker. That... <laughs> um, I have another example where they did essentially that. Oh, cool. You want it? Yeah, we got time. Okay, the fifth element, the... Uh, opera scene. Oh, the opera singer? Hell yeah. Yes. So there's that alien opera singer who has to come out and it's, she is known throughout the universe. Like she's known throughout the solar system as this, I guess even further, known as this beautiful, incredible singer that is capable of things that a human couldn't do. And then you have to watch the whole performance. So like there's nowhere to hide. Like you watch yeah. all of it. And she's, I, they do a really effective thing in the movie where not only is it just like, the poster says that she's a really good singer and like the, like all the idiots in the movie in anticipation of the performance are saying, oh, this is great. This is the best ticket to get. You have to, you have to see this woman. That doesn't mean squat because the main thing is you've been following 
uh, future space cab driver Bruce Willis, <laughs> who this entire movie, when faced with fantastical things, is not impressed. He meets a kick-ass alien, not too impressed. He's mostly like put out by her, and then he ha he has been informed by the president that he needs to go and save the planet and even that he's like super reluctant to because he's just he's he's very much he's such a fun character just like i don't really want to do this it's not it's uh, saving the world that that hardly seems like it's my business so he is at every step of the way unimpressed and uninterested in the things that everyone else thinks is cool yeah. and important and then we watch him watch the performance of this woman who's supposed to be the best singer uh it's beyond singing just like per yeah. performance artist in all of time and he is so moved by her yeah. and she needs to be that good to like <laughs> rewire the brain of this 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 seen it all doesn't care about it all cab driver i well i think he's a really good representation of me in the movie where i was i'm i'm an idiot i don't know opera <laughs> and i'm like well, this shit better be good. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I am the worst audience for an opera to try to move me. And even as a kid, she starts singing and she does this and I'm taken with it. I'm like so yeah. absorbed in the experience. And so I was thinking back on that. I was like, how did they fucking do that? Um, and they did it with magic, Dan. They. I was going to ask if it's fake. Some of it is. So... The woman singing it, it's not actually the woman you see acting there. The woman singing it is this woman named Inva Mula, who is, she's Albanian. She's an opera singer, like a really good opera singer, famous in Albania. But she, um, a lot of what they're doing with the voice is trickery. Like they're having her go from such a low range to a high range that like would be impossible for a human to do. Mm -hmm. And especially like, I guess just the jumps in octave and stuff like that. There are different things throughout it, especially when like the beat starts hitting. You know when she's dancing around, her arms are doing that weird thing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of that that like it sounds like a voice solo. Like a lot of yeah. that is impossible. Um, and so they composed a piece of music for this. Uh, it's based on an opera. Uh, the first part of it is a true opera, and then the when she's dancing around stuff, that's composed. They compose uh, an actual composer did this. They got an actual opera singer, and then on top of the opera singer, they were like, "And now we do these different things. We change the range so that it would be physically impossible for a human to do." And I'm like, "Oh, yeah, you guys did it right. You guys really put the work in. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect." Yeah, and it works. Yeah, it's really wonderful. You have more. Uh. I mean, it's just because it 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 feels like a uh, a cousin to the wonders and that thing you do. The the band in Josie and the Pussycats, the movie fucking rules, and I totally buy them as a real band that would take the world by storm. I have not watched. Again, this I'm, movie. Not, I'm not say, I'm not saying anything. Oh, it's it's real fun. Okay, is it really? Yeah, that was a kid movie. Um. Well, you're. I, I now we're the same age, but by the time it came out, <laughs> you were probably eighteen or nineteen. Yeah, Two thousand one, and, and <laughs> so yeah, I was nineteen. Yeah, uh, so it probably seemed like a kids' movie to you. Okay, yeah, that's that's totally possible. I was also in college, so I wasn't. I was like, right. Why would I go to the movies? Well, right, you're, you're. I'm the main character. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll check this out. I, I will watch this. Uh, it reminded me, just you saying that, like their performance and how they're doing it, that reminds me of, I was not familiar with Zac Efron. I didn't know anything about him until I saw um, Hairspray, the movie. Oh, and yeah. his lady, that song, Lady's Choice, that he does. I was like, this this boy is going to be a star. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> This boy is incredible. Look at his performance. Like I was like an actor doing this knowing how to be yeah. uh, uh, on stage like that. I was like, this is, he's so good. I was really hoping your first Zac Efron thing was going to be not a musical thing because that, that, it's much more fun oh, it's so if great. your exposure to him is like Baywatch or Neighbors and then to see he has this completely other gear that he's really great at, the singing and dancing gear. But, oh well. Yeah. Uh, That's it, how my brother and sister-in-law were with 
Jonathan Groff because they only knew him as an actor in the Mindhunter show, not knowing that he was a Broadway guy for years. And then they put on Hamilton. (laughs) Yeah, they put on Hamilton. They see him as like, hey, it's that, it's that, it's the guy from the cop show. Holy shit, he's got some pipes. (laughs) That's how Anna Kendrick was for me. Up in the Air was my first introduction to her. And then you and I went and watched Pitch Perfect. And I was like, Oh, they, how did they know she could do this? <laughs> oh, it's because she was a, nominated for a Tony when she was nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Well, maybe that's another conversation too, where you re- didn't realize like certain actors had a complete second gear. You're like, yeah. what? We're, we're bagging a couple of good ideas for episodes. Oh, it's going to be fun. All right. But that's it for this one, right? That's it. Hell Yeah. Take us home, Soren. Okay, I'm looking it up. Hold on. I'm doing it slow, just in case you wanted to do it. <laughs> no, I, I I feel like I did the intro and yeah. I came up with the question. You're right. You're right. I'm You're gonna right. I'm gonna coast for the next couple of weeks, actually. Hey everybody, thank you for listening to Quick Question with Soren and Daniel. But you knew that's the name of the podcast already. You can find Daniel on Twitter at DOB underscore inc. You can find Fun fact, you cannot. Did you quit? Uh-huh. No, oh, we should talk about that sometime too. That's exciting. Three more episodes. Got them in the bank. Oh, uh, you can find me on Blue Sky at least at Soren.Bui or just search me on Blue Sky. There's like a thousand people there. I'm, you just look in the crowd and you'll see me. <laughs> uh, you can email us at QQ with Soren and Daniel at gmail.com. We have an Instagram, which is QQ with underscore with underscore Soren underscore and underscore Daniel. I give that one out a lot now because there are some really funny clips that Gabe put together that make us look a lot funnier than we actually are because the timing is perfect and everything. Yeah. Talk about somebody with a second gear. Our uh our producer and sound engineer and editor Gabe Harder is also really great at video as well, it turns out. And uh and we found that out just he just showed us. It was incredible. Um we have a Patreon at Patreon slash quick question. Uh Me Rex did our theme song. You can find their music at merex.bandcamp.com or just put Me Rex in Spotify or iTunes or wherever else you want to listen to your music. Lastly, you can see videos of us doing this podcast at YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash at QQ podcast. That's it. That's it. I've got a quick, quick question for you. All right. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to know what's on your mind. I've got a quick, quick question for you. All right. The answer's not important. I'm just glad that we could talk tonight. So what's your favorite? How did you get? If there's an answer, they're gonna find it I think you'll have a great time here I think you'll have a great time here